Okay. So I want to welcome you all to the 2016 Colorado School of Public Health uh, State of the School Address. Uh, and it's really a great pleasure to be able to share with you all the wonderful things, or at least a sample of the wonderful things that uh, we have all accomplished over the past year. Um, most of it is the result of your work. Pretty much all of it is the result of your work and the work of your colleagues, but I get to brag about it. So, you know, that's, that's a good thing. Um, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to brag a little bit. Um, first, I'm going to start about, talk about where we've, been and where we're headed. Our school now is only a little bit over eight years old, and it started as a wonderful idea of a collaborative school between three strong universities over eight years ago, but we opened our doors just a little over eight years ago, and at that time, a very small school. Over that period of time, we've had a lot of growth. We've grown in terms of our student body, our faculty, our staff, our programming, our research, our community impact. At times, some of the changes we've had over that period of time have been a little painful for many of us, but we've come through it, and we're now at a point where we're really poised to thrive. As an institution, we now have the opportunity to thrive by investing in our people, by investing in our programs, by investing in things that are really going to make a difference in public health in our region and beyond. And that's the message I'm here to deliver to all of you today that we're poised to thrive because of your great work, shared sacrifice, and commitment to public health in our school. And this slide tells you what I think thriving means for us. What does thriving look like? It means we'll have a culture of engagement, diversity, and inclusion with thriving faculty, staff, and students. We'll have educational programs that train outstanding practitioners and researchers. We'll have research programs that generate new knowledge to improve population health. We'll have community partnerships and public health practice that translate into real improvements in public health in our communities. We'll have fiscal strength. But fiscal strength isn't the goal. Fiscal strength is a tool to allow us to thrive. We'll have a reputation of excellence and we'll be a healthy place to learn, a healthy place to work. And you may know we've um, we've established a worksite wellness committee, and you'll hear a little bit more about that. We're going to be focused on our health and well-being. That's what thriving means, to me at least, and I think it means to all of us, thriving as an organization. So we're going to celebrate some of the wins we had this year, and, you know, this is a nice little picture of winning. I think we've had a lot of really great wins over the year as well that put us in the same kind of company as uh, those final five. So we've been reaccredited until 2023. When I actually saw that date for the first time, 2023, it gave me a, a sense of what? 2023? It seems like a long time away. Now, you know, it'll come before you know it, and we'll need to gear up for it again. But many, many thanks to Lori Crane, who led that effort. She just put in a tremendous amount of time leading the effort to get us accredited. Thanks also to all of you who helped. Many people helped with the accreditation uh, process. And our final outcome, of course, was that we were fully accredited, met all the criteria, uh, and we're fully accredited through 2023. So this is just fantastic. And again, many thanks to Lori. Thank you. That there are other notable achievements, probably too many to, to list, and if I missed yours, I'm sorry. Send it to me and send it to Tanya, and we'll, we'll get the news out about it. But we've picked a few things that we heard about that were, are examples of the great work our faculty and students and staff are doing. So in, in just this year, our Center for Global Health with um, Steve Berman's leadership, don't see Steve in the room at the moment, but I see Edwin Asturias, who's also a very important member of the Center for Global Health, and Madiha, who's also an important member there, and there may be others in the room. Uh, they, were, they had their designation as a WHO collaborating center renewed and reaffirmed. Uh, our center is the only center in North America with this WHO designation, which, which tells you the, the quality of the programming in that center. Uh, I had the opportunity to travel to Guatemala earlier this summer and participate in the inauguration of our new lodge there. And that was just a fantastic experience to see the wonderful work that's going on by folks in our Center for Global Health. 
Lee Newman and our Center for Health, Work, and Environment have been uh, awarded a Total Worker Health um, Center. Now, I know Lee's on vacation because I just heard from him. He's um, not able to be here today, but I see some of his team here, and we couldn't be prouder of the work that they're doing in the area of worker health. Other accolades for our school, we're now a gold fit friendly work site from the American Heart Association. Now the highest level is platinum, so we have some work to do, but we're really pleased that we've uh, achieved gold level, second highest level for work site wellness certification from the American Heart Association, uh, which is near and dear to my heart. Uh, and we are also a HealthLink certified partner. So these are ways that we are focused on trying to enhance the, our wellness as an organization. Now, School of Public Health should walk the walk, and we should be focused on, the, on wellness in our community, in our, in our uh, faculty, staff, and students. Um, our faculty have gotten individual awards and accolades, and I'm going to have to move closer to the screen to be able to read them. Um, and perhaps I'll just let you read them instead of reading them out to you. But it's a fantastic list of um, awards that our faculty have, um, have been recognized for their excellence over the past year. And I think in the room, everybody's busy. I don't know if any of the people on this slide are in the room, but if they are, we'd love to give them a round of applause. So why don't you give them a round of applause anyway? We've had growth as a school. I've mentioned the growth we've had over the past eight years, and, and over eight years the growth has been tremendous, but we've had growth over the past year in our school. So here's some of the, the statistics. We've had 77 new faculty appointments over the last year. You can see the list here. Faculty appointments include uh, PRAs in our system. We've also had new staff hired within the school across our campuses. So our school is vibrant and continues to grow. We've had some new leadership join our school. Christine Gillen joined as Associate Dean for Administration and Finance, and I think you've probably all met Christine. She's here in the front row. Fernando Hogin just joined us as Director of the Latino Research and Policy Center. And I'm not sure if Fernando is here, but I hope you have an opportunity to get to know him. I think he's gonna make some strong contributions to our work on improving the health of Latino populations. Um, with leadership transitions, some new people join us, and we have to say farewell with fondness to some people who are moving on. And Jan Gascoigne has accepted a position as Assistant Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs for the CU uh, Anschutz campus. Uh, in this role, she'll be working with all the schools on campus to build processes and enhance processes for all of our schools to deliver quality programming to our students and to focus on issues around student life and student well-being. Jan's been a tremendous uh, part of our school. You know, she helped from the beginning get our practice-based learning program going. Uh, she's really been one of those people who's been instrumental to our success over the last eight years, and we're going to miss her. Um, but we're happy for her in moving into this new role, and, and she'll still be here in helping us move forward and helping us um, train her successor. In the interim, uh, Jan, uh, while we're searching for a, a new associate dean, in that interim, Ben Wyrock is going to serve as interim director of, of student affairs, and Katie um, Brumfield is gonna serve as interim manager of career services. Hey, Donna. Hey, Bob. No, you're right on time. It's hard to find this room. It took me a while to find this room. <laughs> We've just been joined by two members of our advisory board, our chair, Donna Boucher, and one of our advisory board members, Bob Doherty. So I'm very pleased that they could join us today. <laughs> so now I'm going to do a quick, um, a quick reporting on our progress on our strategic priorities. You may remember that we have a strategic plan that we put together, um, I think it was back in 2013, 2014, to take us through 2018. And since it's, we're about halfway through that time period, I'll give you a report on some of the progress we're making on these different priorities. Our first priority was enhancing and facilitating student success. Sounds very bland. All the high-level priorities will sound bland, but the 
progress within each will sound really great. So we've had our students take on major roles in the success of our school. We had a student-led workshop on mental health. We've had our uh, third annual public health case competition. The, the photo that you see here is the winning team from the case competition from last year. That competition is open to all students in the School of Public Health as well as all students in schools on this campus, students in the undergraduate program on the Denver campus, uh, and the, the groups are multidisciplinary, representing students from across the different programs, uh, and they did a really great job. The winning team last year was able to present their ideas, their about improving health to the Colorado Board of Health. Uh, and in uh, past years, and we hope again this year, we'll also be able to um, participate in the Emory uh, case competition that is international in nature. We also have scholarships for our students to attend public health in the Rockies and the APHA meeting. So these are ways in which we're focusing on our student success. Our career services program under Ben Wyrock's leadership has really made great strides. Uh, four or five years ago, this was an area that consistently got um, mediocre, at best, satisfaction ratings from our students. They said they didn't feel like we were doing a very good job of helping them get placed in uh, exciting, compelling careers. Uh, and we've made great progress in this, in this area, uh, and a lot of the credit goes to Ben and his team. You know, 98% of our graduates are now working or continuing their education, and our satisfaction rating is, is like 95%. So that's really been turned around an example of an area in which we're now thriving, uh, in which we were previously, I would say, struggling. Practice-based learning is going great under um, Olivia Jolly's leadership. We have a, a thriving practice-based learning component to our school. Our school's been growing, and the demand for finding outstanding practicum placements for a growing number of students is a really big challenge, and Olivia and her team have really been doing a great job. This past year, we put 185 students in practicum positions, but we had 230 students join us this year in the MPH program, so this challenge continues to grow, and I'm confident that Olivia and her team will continue to meet that challenge and that we'll continue to thrive in this area. We're getting increased placements of our students in international practicums as we focus more on global health. And uh, Madiha has also helped us with that. Uh, and I just couldn't be happier with the way our practice-based learning program is going. We continue to grow our educational offerings with a focus on the future of public health practice and public health research. And these are some of the most recent offerings added to our curriculum for students. Uh, just this year, we've approved three new certificate programs. Uh, just this fall, we've launched several new educational programs as we continue to um, really try to improve our impact on public health through educating the workforce of the future. Our students are getting recognized for their excellence, and this slide shows a couple of the students who've been, who have received awards over the past year. Megan Kane has received several awards from the National SOFI Group, uh, as well as from the United Nations Association. Uh, and Dustin Curry, who worked with um, uh, Don Comstock, has won awards for his work in injury. And Suzuho Shimasaki has um, won an award at the APHA Council of Affiliates for Outstanding Student of the Year. Uh, so our students are doing great work, and their work is getting recognized. I mentioned our, our growth in our student body. And that's what this slide demonstrates, that our student body continues to grow. This is the MPH program across all three campuses. That is the program that's shared across our three campuses. And we've seen growth in all, these, uh, all three programs over the past eight years. Um, you might wonder when the growth is going to start to plateau. We seem, I, th I think uh, at CSU, we're close to a plateau. At UNC, we still have some room for growth. And on this campus, I would suspect that we'll see this curve begin to plateau over the next couple of years. Many of the programs on this campus, I'm hearing the, the faculty are very happy with the level of students that are in the program currently and are not eager to see the programs grow much beyond where they are. But there are other programs where the faculty are eager to, eager to see more students come in. You might get an idea of where they are based on where the new educational programs 
are that have been approved within the past year. Those are the areas that are likely to continue to grow, but my suspicion is that over the next couple of years, we'll see a slower rate of growth than we've seen over the past couple of years. This slide shows our total educational enrollment across all degree programs, um, including our certificate students who are pursuing a certificate rather than a degree. Uh, also shows the impact of our students in terms of the graduates that we're producing. There are the people going out into the workforce either to do research or to do public health practice, as well as the students who are going out into practicum assignments, making an impact on public health now through their practicum work. And again, growth continues, um, is likely to begin to plateau over the next couple of years. Our students primarily come from Colorado. That's the biggest part of the pie. Second largest slice is the, the group of students who come from other western regional governor states. Uh, this is a program in which western states uh, offer in-state tuition to students from other western states. Third largest group is from um, uh, non-resident students. That would include international students and students from eastern states who are uh, paying out-of-state tuition at least for the first year while they establish Colorado residency. And we get our students through uh, recruitment efforts in a, in a variety of ways. One of the things that we've really focused on over the last couple of years is trying to increase our scholarship support. Uh, and when I reported last year that we had this huge increase in scholarship support, I had some people say, well, we don't really believe that number because it looks like a huge jump from one year to the next. And so we, we took a very deep dive this year to try to figure out whether there was something wrong with that number. You know, why did we have such a huge increase in scholarships? Now, partly we were purposely trying to increase our scholarship funding. Um, but we took a deep dive this year, and I credit Marshall and Christine for doing this work. And we identified a, uh, a, the vast majority of the expenses in this account code of scholarships look like real scholarships, but there are some that look like maybe they're not. And so one of the things we're going to focus on over this coming year is really doing some quality improvement on how we track and record these expenses so we can get a very accurate view of what our scholarship program really looks like so we can get it to where we want it. And so in the, in the review we did this year, the height of the blue bar is the, um, the scholarships that look like, you know, really bona fide scholarships. And the other expenses, that bar on top, we have a few questions about. We're going to try to run those down and see, you know, are they really scholarships or were they coded to the wrong account code? And do we need to do some QI so that, you know, if you don't know what you're doing, it's hard to get it better. So we're going to try to figure out what we're doing here and make it better. But we're pleased that there is real growth in our scholarship program and we're committed to continued growth in our scholarship program. Okay. Um, we've been talking about adding a new strategic priority. So this is one that wasn't part of our original five strategic priorities, and it's about enhancing our culture of diversity and inclusion. Now, we have established a working group that's focused on diversity and inclusion, and we have a plan that um, is focused on improving diversity and inclusion. And so we did a climate survey in spring of 2015, and the results of that survey have been presented by and large, the results were very positive. I'm an optimist. I think you have to be an optimist to be in academia and certainly to be in administration. You have to be an optimist. So when I look at the results, I see mostly good things, but we also saw areas where we can clearly improve. And some of them are listed here on the slide. Uh, sensitivity training for instructors. And, and one of the things that really came clear was that, um, you know, some of us and all of us at times are a little uncomfortable with things that are said in the classroom and we don't really know how to react in the moment. And, but if we don't react in the moment, the moment passes and the opportunity is lost to deal with the issue that's raised. And so we have to become more comfortable with acting in the moment. We have to become more comfortable with being uncomfortable <laughs> with acting in the moment. Uh, and um, that's going to be one of our areas of focus over the next year is helping each other learn how to be more comfortable in those awkward moments and not miss the opportunity uh, to deal with the situations that present to themselves to us in the classroom in particular. But some of these are outside the classroom too and hopefully the same strategies will work. So some of the things we're doing, 
Um, we got a grant from the uh, CU Office of Diversity and Inclusion, Carol Runyon, who I see here, Jan Gascoigne, and Carolyn DiGiuseppe are uh, leading that grant, and it's going to provide funding to have some workshops and to bring in an external faculty member who can facilitate some of those workshops, Renee Johnson. Some of you may have met her when she visited us previously. Really excited about that. Our Office of Academic Affairs is also doing some webinars and trainings. At our recent faculty meeting, Cerise Hunt led a training around um, these issues and, and especially about how to deal with awkward moments in the classroom. About 15 of us were in the room. I thought it was a fantastic workshop. It helped me develop some strategies to know when to say ouch and uh, how, to, how to deal with uncomfortable moments in the classroom. So I thought it was great. Uh, we're also recognized for some of our focus on health equity. Our Center for Public Health Practice received an award this year from the um, Colorado Black Health Collaborative for our work on promoting uh, health equity. So we're very proud of that. That's Virginia Vis County and uh, Cerise Hunt there, and I see them both here. Congratulations and thanks for what you're doing. So what about diversity from the point of view of our student body? Our student body is about 80% female. So we have a little bit of work to do to try to bring more men into public health. Um, you know, so that's, that's something we, we need to focus on. Judith Albino says that's because public health isn't well paid. And so that means we need to work on getting public health better paid so we can attract more men into public health so we have a more diverse workforce. From a, um, uh, from a demographic perspective, we're doing better than ever with the demographics of our students. So about 64% of our students are currently, uh, of our current students are non-Hispanic white. As we've been growing our student body, that number's been coming down, which is a good thing because, you know, the concern is that as you focus on growth, you might not increase diversity. But as we focused on growth, we've actually had an increase in the diversity of our student body. We still have work to do, but we're, we're headed in a good direction, and I'm very pleased about that. What about our faculty and leadership? So our students are about 80% female, our faculty are about 70% female, and our leadership's about 60% female. So, you know, that's, uh, that t that's telling. Um, you know, but it, at least our leadership is at least 60% female, which I think is actually pretty good. If you look around academic institutions around the country, uh, I'm pretty pleased that we're at that point. Now, the diversity of our student body is far greater than the diversity of our faculty. And so we have some work to do to try to figure out how we can attract, recruit, retain outstanding scholars that contribute to the diversity of our faculty. That's a challenge for us that I think we need to embrace. Uh, our staff are more diverse than our faculty. Um, and our leadership, we don't have the statistics down here, but our leadership could be more diverse as well. Um, so these are challenges we need to embrace as a school. Okay, strategic priority number two, back to the priorities we already agreed on. Um, this is about our um, research and creative activities. Okay, so how are we doing there? Well, under Spiro Manson's leadership as our associate dean for research, we've, we are participating in a, um, in a national program to train early career in, uh, faculty in research methods called Gumshoe. I see Spiro here. Thanks, Spiro, for your leadership. Um, we've also got uh, this new lodging facility in Trefinio in Guatemala that I mentioned I was able to uh, visit and attend an inauguration that was established under Edwin Asturias' leadership and Steve Berman's leadership. That's fantastic. Uh, and we have recently launched the CU Consortium on Climate Change and Health, which is a campus-wide, actually larger than campus-wide, statewide um, consortium focused on one of the most pressing issues our world is facing, which is planetary health, climate change, and the impact on human health and actually all life on the planet, right? That doesn't get much more important than that. So we're very pleased about that effort going forward. Rosemary Rochford, who's a faculty member in environmental and occupational health, is leading that effort. Numbers. I'm an epidemiologist, and I like numbers. So um, this is not a great way to try to measure our research impact, but it's an easy way to measure our research success, uh, and that's numbers. So this past year, we had our most successful year ever in research funding. Uh, we had about $29 million direct funding for research projects in the school on this campus. 
It's been harder for us to get data from our partnering campuses, but our estimate is about $5 million a year in research funding by our faculty on our partnering campuses. With just the funding on this campus, the school rate ranks 20th out of the 70, is it 70? 70 schools and programs reporting to our Association of Schools and Programs of Public Health. I think that's really good after eight years. I mean, that's something to be proud of. This faculty is outstanding. If you add in the five million or so from our partnering campuses, we're up into about 14th across um, schools and programs that report nationally to our organization. And that represents the, the breadth and strength of the research program that our students also have access to for learning about research while they're here uh, as learners. So I couldn't be more proud of our faculty. The pie chart shows you where the funds, how the funds come into our school, again, on this campus. And I think that's a very healthy pie chart because the pie chart isn't really dominated by one or two or three programs. It's a very diverse research portfolio. And I think we should all be proud of that. Um, you might not understand all the acronyms. If you really want to know later, you know, come down and buy me a beer and I'll, <laughs> and I'll try to remember all the acronyms myself. Okay, so there are also some really great research highlights. And I'm not going to read all these to you, but I thought I would show you a few slides that indicate some of the big dollar uh, wins that we got over the past year because there are multiple of them across our campuses here and on our partnering campuses um, that, are, that are worth you taking just a moment to take a look at. And then when you see your colleagues who have been leading the teams because there are teams that are getting these awards, congratulate your colleagues, congratulate their team members um, because this is work that's going to move the needle on public health over the decades to come. So there's the first few Here's a few more really great work that's going on by faculty and staff in our, in our school, projects that students also have an opportunity to participate in. Here's a few more. I'm going to stop with the list at this point because, you know, we could just keep going and going with the, the research grants that our faculty are getting. And we get new news frequently about newer awards coming in. So I couldn't be more proud of the faculty and staff that are, that are getting this. Where are we headed with other areas of growth in terms of our research and educational programs? These are some of the things that the leadership team is, is, um, is focused on at the moment. So data science, we're working primarily with the leadership of Debasha Skosh and Nicole Carlson. We're working with um, campus leaders to establish a, um, a campus solution to our data science opportunities. Um, there are major opportunities and some challenges to uh, advancing data science on this campus. And with Nicole and Debashis, uh, we're working with campus leadership to really elevate this to a campus priority so that we can have the uh, data science capacity that we need to do the research that's going to be important over the, the coming decades. Mobile and digital health is likely to be integrated in that effort. And Sheena Bull's been leading our center for um, mobile health. Uh, really pleased about the progress that's going on there. One, I think maybe one of the grants that you saw was a, a grant from OEDIT, the Office of Economic Development and International Trade. I think it's like a million and a half dollars to, do, to, to enhance our mobile health uh, efforts. Population health, we've developed a, the Colorado Collaborative for Population Health on this campus. I see Frank Degree, my, my, one of my best partners in that effort. We've pulled together leadership from across the schools on campus and the hospital systems on campus, as well as Tri-County Health Department, to focus on how we can collaboratively improve population health as a campus, not just as a school, I'm thinking about population health broadly from the perspective of the Affordable Care Act and people who've been writing about this concept. So it's not just public health, but it's public health working together with the healthcare system and with other healthcare professionals in an interprofessional way to make a difference in, uh, in population health in our region. And that's very exciting. The Behavioral Health Initiative, Jen Leiferman has just submitted a proposal for a new behavioral health initiative to our school. It was discussed at the Executive Council this week. Uh, the discussion was very positive. 
the way we work these days, we try to have it on the discussion agenda one month and then the action agenda the next month. So we'll wait and see what the action agenda looks like next month and whether we move forward with this. But I'm very optimistic that we will. Uh, It's an opportunity for us to train people who have both public health skills and competencies and knowledge about the important behavioral health issues that our country is facing, suicide, depression, anxiety. And these are problems that are huge here in Colorado, but huge across our country. And very few schools of public health have um, begun to address them. Uh, Last time we looked, there's only one school of public health in the country that has a department of uh, mental health within the School of Public Health. That's Johns Hopkins. That's also the only School of Public Health that has a doctoral degree focused in this area. It's only a couple of others that have master's degrees in this area. And given the importance of mental health to our public health, I think this is an area our school should um, should embrace and, and really move forward in. And I'm really thankful that Jen led a, a group of faculty who, from all three of our campuses, who've put together a really strong proposal. And I hope the Executive Council uh, members will also see it very positively. I think the initial reading was was quite positive. Cognitive health, you've heard me talk about this before. Um, As a country and as a world, one of the epidemics we're facing that we're woefully unprepared for is the the epidemic of dementia. Uh, Our current solutions or current approaches, they're not solutions, Our current approach to to dementia is um, really kind of wait for it to happen and then to take care of people in skilled nursing facilities. You know, this is not a public health approach, and it's not the way public health has addressed previous epidemics. Uh, There aren't many schools of public health taking a public health approach to this challenge, uh, and it's something that we as a school and we as a society really need to be focused on. Um, I'm optimistic that we will. Uh, but it's going to be a heavy lift. And so that's something we're going to need to continue to talk about. Strategic priority number three, this is our financial future. And at some of our previous State of the School addresses, this has been a fairly negative part of the talk. <laughs> so I'm happy that it's a very positive part of the talk this year because we've come through our sustainability plan and our sustainability period. And I think, as you've heard me say earlier, we are poised to thrive You know, with the hard work and shared sacrifice, we've really overcome uh, the fiscal challenges that we uh, understood and began to approach four or five years ago. We ended fiscal year 16 in the black for the first time ever as a school. That was fantastic. All our units, uh, all departments ended the year in the black. So did the central school dean's office under our... So our approach to decentralized um, revenue sharing and decentralized allocation of expense authority so that we could align incentives with with authority, you know, it's working. It's working. It's been hard, and it's at times been painful. But we're we're coming out, and we're now able to invest these resources in ways that will help us thrive, investing in faculty and staff support and continuing to pursue our decentralization model investing in scholarships for our students and shared governance and strategic recruitment and initiatives like the Behavioral Health Initiative. We couldn't have considered doing something like that three years ago. We can consider doing that this year uh, because we're fiscally strong enough to make that kind of investment. We also are attracting investment from other places in our school. And just as I mentioned last year, in the midst of our financial difficulties, we've continued to attract support for our school and investment in our school. Here are three examples from this past year. Uh, The Colorado Trust invested $3 million in our Centers for American Indian Alaska Native Health to endow the Colorado Trust Chair in American Indian Health. Uh, Richard Hoffman, who's one of our largest individual donors and benefactors, a previous health director for the state. Um, He he has uh, committed to a over a million dollars in in funding for a scholarship endowment and for support to recruit a faculty member in infectious disease epidemiology. And the chancellor, when he saw what we're doing and how successful we're being, has invested in our Center for Health, Work, and Environment and our Department of Environmental and Occupational Health to help that group um, 
continue to pursue its vision and its mission. So these are indicators of people betting on an institution that's thriving. This is the um, chart that used to be ugly. And it's the chart you've seen before that compares our expense curve to our revenue curve. Uh, and in the early days, as you would expect for a startup organization, expenses outpaced revenue, and we were living on startup funds, but startup funds that would eventually be depleted uh, and that we would no longer have to call on. So we had to grow our revenue base so that we could support our activities. And we've gone over the last four or five years from a situation where we had a $2.5 million annual operating deficit to this past year, we ended the year with a $1.7 million surplus across all units in the school. Now, we don't exist to generate a surplus. We exist to pursue our mission. So we'll be investing that money strategically. Some of it will be kept held aside for the rainy day because, you know, rainy days may come. Grant funding may be tough to get. Uh, so it's, it's wise to keep some reserves for rainy days. But we'll also be investing some of that money uh, in new strategic priorities. For example, perhaps the Behavioral Health Initiative. I think I've mentioned that three times now. Uh, here's how we budgeted our money for the coming fiscal year, the one, we're actually the one we're in now. Uh, fiscal year 17 started July 1. Um, you'll see on the, that we have about a $12 million budget. That's our, our unrestricted budget. That's not including the $29 million or so we expect in the research budget. That's restricted. It has to be spent on the research projects that uh, are supported. So this is about a quarter, maybe a little bit more than a quarter of our all-funds budget but it's the unrestricted budget that we have greater flexibility around. Um, about two-thirds of that money comes from tuition, so we need to be very nice to our students and thank them and, uh, and, and deliver them the highest quality educational programs that we can. That's about two-thirds of our unrestricted budget. The other third comes from the state, from the university, from indirect cost recovery generated by our research programs. And then how do we spend that? The vast majority is spent on us on salary and um, benefits. Uh, that's where the vast majority of the money goes in, a, in an academic institution. Um, the part of the, of the pie that says commitments, that's commitments the school has to research centers and programs within the school, and the vast majority of that money gets spent on us, on faculty and staff who are doing the mission of the school. Uh, you see a little bit is spent on scholarships, 3%. So even with the great increase we've had in our scholarship program, it's only about 3% of our unrestricted budget. Uh, operating is only about 7%. The CSU and UNC lines are the tuition generated at CSU and UNC that we pass on to them after the dean's tax. Um, and what do you think they spend that money on? Faculty and staff primarily, right? So... You get the message. And then we anticipate having a small surplus this year, uh, which is really great news. So our budget for the current fiscal year also looks strong. How is that allocated in terms of our decentralization model? Well, you may know we've gone through a lot of effort to try to implement a model in which revenue is shared within the departments under a formula that provides clear incentives so that <clears throat> department leadership and department faculty uh, can really chart their course and plan strategically for growth in educational programs, growth in faculty, growth in research programs. And about half of the uh, discretionary budget goes out directly to departments through our revenue sharing plan. Okay? That 13 or 14 percent that you see in commitments, again, that's going out to research centers and programs. So, and is for their um, strategic planning and strategic use. CSU and UNC, you see that on the, on the um, pie chart again. That's, again, the tuition that goes to our partner campuses. And then you see two slices that represent central school administration. One slice that's unique to this campus. That's to pay for things like HR on this campus that support us on this campus but don't really have a role to support our school at CSU and UNC. That's a slice of the pie I have to keep track of because when I report to our interinstitutional steering committee, the provosts and the chancellors of all three universities, the chancellor at CSU and the president at UNC, they don't want to be paying for 
things that only support us here, and that's understandable. The other slice that says school, that's your, our overall dean's office that's responsible for administering the school across all three campuses. It's about a quarter of a quarter of our total budget. So it's a quarter of this budget, which is about a quarter of our all funds budget, and we're looking for ways to keep that administrative cost lean because the, to the extent that we can put more funds out in departments and centers where departments and centers can drive strategic growth, I think that's the, that's the vision that at least we aspire to from a central administrative point of view. Um, I also am aware and, and you know, certainly hear this from some of our, our department chairs that they would like central administration to be able to help at times with um, recruitment packages for new faculty. So, you know, that's the trade-off and the tension between how much of the pie stays central and how much of the pie goes decentralized out to uh, departments and centers and units. But we're keeping our eye on that, and you can, you can bet the chairs are keeping their eye on this, right? So our fourth strategic priority is strengthening our school's identity. Being a collaborative school, being the Colorado School of Public Health, and I still have to correct things in press releases when I see it, the University of Colorado School of Public Health drives me crazy. We're the Colorado School of Public Health, and the media don't really know what that is. So we've really been working on trying to get across the point that we are the Colorado School of Public Health, not the University of Colorado School of Public Health. We're a collaborative institution with three strong partners. That means a lot to us. And so that means we have to have special permissions to do things like having our own branded website. When I first got here, my first business cards were the routine Anschutz Medical Campus business cards. And my first visit to CSU, I remember the first person I handed one of those cards to, they scowled at me. I won't tell you who it was. Um, and it was because that card had Anschutz on it. It didn't say anything about CSU. It didn't say anything about UNC. Now if you look at my business card, it's got all three logos. It's Colorado School of Public Health. You know, and that was because when I came back from that meeting, I told our, the head of communications for this campus, I wasn't going to give out any more business cards until we got new business cards approved that didn't have Anschutz on them. It had all three logos on it because how can you be dean of a collaborative enterprise and hand out business cards that don't reflect that? And we've been able to get that message out so that we can have the identity that we need, the brand that we need, to showcase what we truly are, which our students have access to a wealth of classes across three campuses, a tremendous faculty across three campuses. Our faculty have access to each other across all three campuses, and we need to continually promote that message. And that's what we're trying to do through these activities that um, strengthen our school identity. We're active in social media. Now, I'm looking in the room, and some of you may be more active in social media than others. I suspect there's a bimodal distribution <laughs> of participation in social media in the room. Uh, but in public health, we always teach, and we believe that you have to meet people where they are. So if we're talking about especially meeting the students of the future, the learners of the future, you know, the, the students who are out there now, the prospective students, they were born after the social media revolution, right? So this has just been part of reality. And so we've, we've um, dove head in, we've dove in head first. And we're very active. Our communications team under Tanya, Tanya Ewers, uh, wonderful leadership, has really made some great strides in the area of our social media presence. Um, I have a Twitter account. I don't have an Instagram account. And Tanya keeps telling me she's going to get me there one day. But um, I'm part of that. I'm in the middle of that bimodal distribution, I guess. But this is really remarkable. We're, we're getting good uptake on, on our social media channels. Strategic party number five is our community service. It's... Um, developing strong partnerships with community-based organizations and participating in community service, public health practice to improve health in the community. And we have a lot of things going on in this area to be proud of. Our Center for Public Health Practice does a lot of trainings. I see Cerise Hunt here, our director for the center. And under her leadership, we've had tremendous strides in the impact of our training program. You'll see on the, on the, on the next slide. Our Rocky Mountain Public Health Training Center, Elaine Scallon is leading that. Um, we're one of 11 uh, HRSA-funded 
public health training centers in the country. We're responsible for Colorado, Utah, Wyoming, Montana, North and South Dakota. Okay, so that's a real plum for us. Echo Colorado, Tim Byers helped get that started before he retired. Fred Thomas is the director of that now. That's a multinodal, bi-directional uh, web um, uh, enhanced or, uh, or web-based learning community program that's reaching out to um, learners all across the state of Colorado. And then we're doing our public health symposia. We've had a variety of symposia. You know, we try to stay away from controversial issues. So, you know, if you look at the topics here, we've only done things like oil and gas development, marijuana, and behavioral health, and, <laughs> you know. I think, you know, I, I, I keep hearing guns is on, gun violence is on the list for upcoming symposia. Are we, are we, are we going to do that one? we got to see if there's some uh, legal things. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said, I don't think we should shy away from controversial issues. No, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I think these are, the, it's important to convene public health discourse around these issues uh, because these are the issues that are important to our health. This slide shows the impact of our training program, um, and you'll see a big spike as we become more um, web smart and more web capable in delivering our educational programs to the workforce. We've seen uptake in, uh, in the trainings that we're delivering and uptake in the individuals that are getting trained through our training programs. This is our impact on the public health practice community. And this is just fantastic. So again, we're thriving and we're helping our public health community thrive. Uh, I was at Public Health in the Rockies last week and you know the, the students and faculty and staff we had there, the alumni we had there, we had a, a, a social event for School of Public Health family, right, faculty, staff, students, alumni, um, the whole meeting had about 500 people. We had 99 people at our social event for the Scott Colorado School of Public Health family at Public Health in the Rockies. That's tremendous. It's wonderful. It's um, one of those happy times, right, for the folks who were there. It was a great, and it's a wonderful opportunity to interact with the public health practice community. I'll put a plug out there. As you think about your annual travel plans, Think about public health in the Rockies. Uh, it's a fantastic place to interact with our alumni, to interact with practicing public health professionals, to stay connected to what's going on in the real world. Our students go up there and they see examples of real public health practice. And admittedly, many of the things they see, many of the presentations and projects they hear about are never going to be published in an academic journal. And the only way to learn about this real world experience is to go there and hear it. So it's a tremendous opportunity. I think if you talk with students who were there, they will tell you that uh, they really valued it. So looking ahead, you know, I'm, I'm very optimistic about where our school is. We've come a long way from the early days. We've come through some tough phases where, you know, things were, you know, kind of sad financially. Uh, and we're now at a position where we're thriving and we're poised to thrive. We're poised to make investments in people and programming that's really going to make a difference in public health in our region. Um, this is what I see ahead of us, conditions for all of our units and campuses to thrive, our faculty, our staff, our students, our alumni to thrive by engaging with our school. We'll, we'll be continuing to cultivate our culture of inclusion. Uh, we'll have strong partnerships with our community-based organizations. And our alumni will be... Um, They'll want to continue to work with us and mentor our students and thrive right along with us. So those are all the things that I came here to brag about uh, uh, with you today about things you've been doing. Uh, now I get to the part of the presentation that I'm a little bit choked up about, and that's that I have one final announcement for you, and that is that I've accepted a position at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. Uh, where I'll be director for the Division of Cardiovascular Sciences. I'll start that position uh, about the 1st of December. Uh, for somebody who has spent the last 25 years focused on doing cardiovascular disease uh, prevention research and cardiovascular health promotion research, it's really exciting. <clears throat> but it's not without some mixed emotion uh, over leaving here because, you know, we've come a long way and we've got a bright future. Uh, and I couldn't be more pleased uh, with where we're headed. 
So I'll be watching, and uh, I'll be really excited to see all the successes of the future. And while I'm admittedly a bit sad about leaving, I'm very excited about the opportunity ahead, and I'm very proud of all that you've done over the past several years and how you've welcomed me into your family um, while I've been here. So thanks very much, and uh, I wish you all the best in the future. So this is the, uh, the question period. Anybody have questions or suggestions or reactions, not about NHLBI, but about the school and where the school is headed? Yes. Wonderful. So I was asked uh, at the beginning of this to try to repeat questions when they were asked so that people who are watching on the live stream can hear the questions. So I'll do my best. So the question had to do with how, how would I describe our school's academic identity um, in thinking about what we want to be known for and maybe what we are known for. And, and I will confess that that's a really challenging question because you ask 10 different people, you probably get 20 different answers, right? Um, but what I, what I have um, learned here is that there are some things that faculty who are involved in this school have been doing for a long time that was, was excellent before there was a school. And I'll probably leave some things out, but the things I would point out that fit into that kind of historical strength category are our work in American Indian Alaska Native Health, our work in diabetes and obesity, both epidemiology and prevention, and our work in cancer prevention and control. Uh, that's work that's been strong for decades, not, you know, eight years, but decades, and really reflects some of the strengths of the Department of Preventive Medicine and Biometrics and the Centers for American Indian and Alaska Native Health that were in the Department of Psychiatry before the School of Public Health was established. And of course, that's a focus on this campus. At CSU, I would say the strengths that have been historical have been in the area of infectious disease epidemiology, especially with vector-borne and um, uh, animal-associated um, uh, infections. There's been a long history of public health nutrition, health communication at CSU. And at UNC, the historical strength has been community health education. That program, that MPH program, was there before there was a school of public health. So these are historical strengths that were the foundation that the school was built on. Since the school's been established, there have been several notable areas that have been added, and, and again, across our campuses. On this campus, some examples of things that have been added have been a stronger focus on maternal and child health, a focus on injury that was already there but was strengthened by the combination of effort here and at CSU. There were injury strength on both those campuses, and it's become stronger. Food safety, uh, again, collaboratively with um, CSU and here. Uh, environmental uh, and occupational health, again, collaboratively between here and uh, CSU. Healthy aging at UNC. Global health came into our school from elsewhere. Latino research and policy came into our school from elsewhere. You know, you start to tick them off, and I may have left some out that I'm gonna get kicked about later, you know, but uh, there's a lot of areas where, where we are really doing great work. Um, you know, so if you say, what are, what are three or four things, and I give you 10 or 12, you know, that's the reality of our school. We have strength, we have diversity. Uh, that pie chart that showed the the fact that it's not just one research program that's generating all the research funding that comes into the school, but that it's a, a, a strong and broad program. I should mention the One Health work at uh, CSU as another area of growing strength. The concept of One Health is that there's really only one health on the planet, 
people can't be healthy unless the animals and plants that we share our environment with are also healthy. So um, that's been an area of, of focus to grow uh, at CSU. So that's a lot to try to communicate. That's part of our challenge is how do we communicate our strengths and our identity when we have so much to talk about. It makes it tough to have that you know, elevator speech that is going to really, um, you know, gonna, you know, really crystallize it. But on the other hand, it's wonderful to have the diversity of strengths that we do. Other questions or comments? Reactions, anything I left out of that list? Yeah, we have a number of students in the audience. Uh, Randy asked a question already, but uh, can you give, uh, I don't know, some little nuggets of wisdom to the students as they're growing and emerging in their career as it pertains to uh, maybe a presentation or uh, something that they can look forward to as they are soon to graduate and, and be part of our alumni base? So I have to give the G-rated version of this. When I, when I met with the students earlier in the month, I gave the R-rated version of this. Uh, but since I'm being recorded, I have to give the G-rated version of this. So the G-rated version starts with the idea that, you know, what you're going to bring to your team, what employers are looking for these days is what people talk about, the T, the, the T um, oh gosh, I'm blocking on the word, but it's the T-shaped individual. That's it, the T-shaped individual. Well, what does that mean? Who's heard of the T-shaped individual? Only a couple people. So the T-shaped individual has an upright and a crossbar. And the upright is depth in a disciplinary area. So while you're here at the school, learn your stuff, whatever it is. Might be biostatistics, might be epidemiology, might be community behavioral health. Depth. Learn your depth and your expertise. If you don't have that to bring to your team, you know, then you, you don't have a lot to bring to your team. So what's the crossbar? That's the leadership skills that you need to bring to your team to work in a team setting. Communication skills, interpersonal skills, listening skills. Okay. Being able to be an effective member of a team requires more than just knowing everything there is to know about your discipline. It's about knowing how to get along with people. So the G-rated version of that means don't be a jerk, right? There's an, there's an R-rated version of that advice. The G-rated version is don't be a jerk. Now, none of you are jerks, okay? But that's the funny part, right? Be nice. Recognize that everybody else in the room is smart, too. And, uh, you know, you're not always going to win the debate. Don't make the team come back and revisit decisions that have been made in the past. Move forward, recalibrate, tweak, that kind of stuff. Be T-shaped. There's a wonderful quote from Theodore Roosevelt that pertains to that. Nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. Yeah. I hope everybody heard John. He was quoting... Theodore Roosevelt, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care, which I think is a good uh, adage to uh, live your life by. And if you go into the Office of Student Affairs these days, there are some pithy little quotes of advice on the board, on the whiteboard, white wall, and uh, you can kind of see what different people are putting up there for your uh, amusement. The one I put up there was carpe diem, you know, and it's like seize the day. Every day is a new day. Every day is a new challenge. Every day is a new opportunity. Uh, don't let them go by because you don't get to hit the rewind button. Any questions or comments from the live stream, Elizabeth? Nothing yet. Okay. Anything else in the room? All right. Well, if nothing else in the room, I think... Is there a place where we have some refreshments? Right outside this door. Right outside the door in that little lobby area. We have some refreshments where we can mingle and you can talk with your colleagues about, you know, some of the things you heard about wonderful things like maybe the Behavioral Health Initiative and what that's all about <laughs> and the difference that's going to make in the world or, or meet the new director of our Latino Research and Policy Center, Fernando Holguin, who joined us. So you'll have a chance to meet him. And I look forward to seeing you out there with the, with the uh, refreshments. Thanks for coming. <laughs>